Welcome to This Week in Money. I'm Jim Goddard. Today, CIBC Wood Gundy's Ross Clark on the Canuck Buck taking a rest after a nine-week climb. Former National Revenue Minister Garth Turner rates the Trudeau government's first budget, is running $30 billion deficits the way to economic health, and what could have been done better. We'll talk to Ross Clark right after this. Unbelievable harmony, spectacular performance, the ultimate tribute to the Everly Brothers and Simon and Garfunkel, Bird Dog, and the Vintage Electric Band, coming to Mission White Rock, West Vancouver. Buy online and save at OnTourTickets.com. Welcome to This Week in Money, the source for market opinions. Here is Jim Goddard. My guest is Ross Clark, investment advisor at CIBC Wood Gundy in Vancouver. Welcome back to This Week in Money, Ross. I always enjoy being with you, Jim. The Canuck Buck has done a pretty good run, down a little bit on Friday, but still not bad for the last few weeks. It's been an exciting ride from 68 cents up, and we had nine consecutive weeks of upside, and looks as though this is the one week that it starts to give back. Uh, down fractionally on the week, maybe a one and a half percent or so but after a pretty big run it's it's overdue for the correction and uh, you know some people on uh, the day after the election saw or the uh, day after the budget saw the dollar drop uh, like uh, three quarters of a percent maybe down one percent and they were saying oh it's a you know it relates to the budget well in reality it related to what was happening everywhere in the world uh, currencies were down against the U.S. dollar. Uh, the oil market was down. Um, you take the, the Australian dollar, one of the closest ties that uh, we would have if you're looking at it relative to the type of economy. Uh, they were down, I think, 0.79% when I looked at it at one point on the day, and the Canadian was down 0.81. So we continue as a dollar to move with the commodities, in particular the uh, the metals side of things and the oil and uh, it's it's a week where we were overdue for the correction, and uh, from our work, the three overbought weeks that we had lead to what should be a decent consolidation and correction to the downside, pretty much hoping for uh, the dollar to give back 60 to 80 percent of the advance off the low. So targeting 70 to 72 cents, I would say, over the next couple of months would, would appear to be realistic. Was it a record to have nine consecutive weeks of an upside for the loonie? Um, close to it. Uh, I think uh, when I looked back, I found a couple, uh, 2003 and 1991. But, you know, you've got to go back a long way. And and uh, the uh, 2003 were an, uh, an extended decline like this one. The 1991 was actually at uh, the tail end of a uh, an exponential run to the upside. But... Uh, a pause at this point would be the most natural thing to uh, to see, and you know it's like all markets you you get actions and reactions. So this is it's time for a reaction. What do you think is the prospects for crude oil right now? Um, oil, we had originally uh, been looking for the thirty six to thirty or thirty six to forty dollar target range. Uh, it overshot that, getting up to forty two, and. Uh, I uh, would suspect uh, as we move into this season, driving season, that uh, you'd see oil start to underperform, especially against gasoline. Um, looking for a pullback maybe into the 32 to $33 range. There's uh, there's pretty good support down there, and uh, it's, uh, I would think that that's realistic. We, uh, you know, when you've had a break as bad as we did, uh, it puts it into the context of moves like we had into 1986, 1992, or the, the 2009 one. And you would expect that we would become uh, part of a large trading range uh, where you might be looking at 25 to 50 is the range for the next couple of years. So um, it, it'll be market where when you get dirt cheap, uh, you can start to put positions on. And as you get up into the upper uh, areas of that boundary and things look overbought. You take a look at the stochastics or the relative strength, and that's that's where you start to lighten up. And I think at that forty to forty-two dollar range we've just seen on the short term, uh, that's pretty good overhead resistance right now. The Trudeau government budget is hoping that it stays at at least forty dollars. Right. Uh, they uh, they clearly need that to uh, make things. Uh, 
balance off, uh, but uh, really they're, they're not balancing. They're just um, working towards a number that I think most of us are, uh, who are more conservative in nature are a little uh, concerned with right now. Gold is getting so much chatter right now, but should you wait a little bit? Has it uh, reached a, a low so you can invest from that point? Uh, from from our perspective, the uh, the rally um, topped out about where it should have in terms of time. Uh, the typically gold will lead oil at the bottom, then they both of them will move up together uh, for about three weeks, which is what happened in the initial stages as gold rallied into well about three weeks ago when it peaked out two and a half three weeks ago. Um, you would expect to see this correction take us down. I would think into the month of April, and uh, historically when you've had commitment of traders' numbers as biased as this one has been with very large speculative positions, it takes a bit of a clean out. So we would hope that it would give back um, anywhere from 50 to uh, 38% of the rally off the bottom. So ideal supports would be at either 1170 or 1200 and on the daily charts, you know, things got a little oversold on Thursday, and you wouldn't you'd expect to see maybe a small bounce, but I think it'll take a bit deeper break before you've got a, a more sustainable low in here. Ross, well, the Canadian dollar isn't expected to make any big jumps anytime soon. Is that good news for Canadian manufacturers in the long run? Well, I mean, definitely, and this is what uh, the uh, Governor Polos has been hoping for, that staying down would help the the, uh, the industrial sector. Now, if we do become capped, as I think we will here, in uh, you know, under 80 cents on the dollar, that will continue to be supportive to, to any of the businesses that are looking to um, uh, produce here and export uh, into the U.S. or elsewhere in the world. Ross, thanks a lot for chatting with us. It was a pleasure, Jim. My guest has been Ross Clark, investment advisor at CIBC Wood Gundy in Vancouver. If you'd like to email Ross, his email is ross.clark at cibc.ca. Coming up next, Garth Turner on This Week in Money. Always consult your investment professional before making any investment decision. This Week in Money is archived online at talkdigitalnetwork.com. My guest is Garth Turner. He's speaking to us from Toronto. He's an investment advisor with Raymond James and the founder of the hugely popular financial blog, greaterfool.ca. And Garth, you're a former national revenue minister as well. Who was the prime minister when you were in charge? <laughs> well, actually, I was in government uh, under a few of them. Uh, when I first went, it was Brian Mulroney. Then we had a brief episode with uh, Kim Campbell. You may remember her. Nice Vancouver girl. And then I was in Ottawa during uh, Stephen Harper's reign as well as Prime Minister. So, um, yeah, I've, I've, I've seen a few of these guys run the country. Interesting. Well, that gives you a great perspective on the new budget presented by the Trudeau government. Is it a good budget? And if it is, why? And if it's not, why not? <laughs> well, you know, that's a pretty deep question because there's a lot of different elements to the budget and some are fine and some aren't. I mean, there was, I'm in the investment financial business, as you mentioned, and, you know, there was a lot of trepidation before Tuesday that the Trudeauites would actually take aim at investors. Uh, and certainly the rumors have been around, you know, capital gains tax would be increased and stock options would be, uh, taxed so there was a lot of concern about that and at the end of the day that didn't happen so there was there was a relief so as far as a lot of investment people go yeah it was okay the budget was okay it didn't really uh impact them a lot or impact investors a lot uh in terms of spending and stimulating the economy i think a lot of economists think that this was the proper thing to do um, that the government did go into some red ink in order to try and rescue the economy from an oil-induced funk that it's been in. So I heard a lot of economists say, yeah, we give this like a, a seven or an eight. Um, in terms of individual families, I don't think there was much impact unless you've got kids and you're probably going to look forward to a bit more money um, there. But the main lasting impact of this government uh, and, and the budget 
was really to um, end a whole era of trying to live within our means. And, you know, love or hate Stephen Harper, but there was this constant sort of struggle to try and get the budget balanced. And Harper was thrown off course dramatically by the financial crisis of 2008, 2009, 2010 that forced him into a, a, a lot of red ink. But here we are. We've got a new day, a new era. There's no recession now. There's no financial crisis. There's just a soggy economy. But this government is not even trying to live within its means. So you know what? I think it's that's going to be the lasting feature here, at least $100 billion in new debt over the next four, four years. If I were a young person today, I wouldn't be too happy about that. Why do you think they decided to spend $30 billion more a year for the next five years more than they brought in or could balance? Uh, I think they're hoping people don't notice. <laughs> I think that there's the public appetite for deficits is pretty good right now because people are more worried about jobs and they're more worried about getting the economy moving. So they're... You know, they're kind of willing to put up with the idea that, yeah, we're going into hawk here, but, well, maybe somebody else is going to pay for it down the road. So I think the public has lost its fear of debt. I also think that the people who have supported Mr. Trudeau, uh, a lot of those supporters are younger. We know from the last election that about 2 million more people started to vote, and Overwhelmingly, they voted for uh, Justin Trudeau, and they were overwhelmingly young people. And it seems today there's not the fear of debt among young people that there has been in the past. Maybe that's because they've all got student debt. Maybe that's because they're having a hard time getting into the workforce. Maybe it's because houses cost such a stupid amount right now that people have to take giant mortgages. Maybe people just aren't afraid of debt. But I think the government's counting on that, and I think that's why they opted, instead of, you know, paring back spending, to ramp it up and uh, try to roll the dice and see if a whole bunch of extra spending would stimulate the economy into more growth. We have no idea if that's going to work, but we're into the gamble now. What's the likelihood the deficit this year will be higher than the $30 billion announced? I think it's a pretty fair gamble. It might be 50% chance that it will be higher. I don't know. Um, nobody knows. And a lot of this has to do with the price of oil. And we don't know where that's going. It's notoriously volatile. It accounts for like almost 20% of Canadian exports, so it's like really important. And the government now is forecasting a fairly low oil price. So if oil goes higher, if it gets back up to 50 or 60 bucks a barrel, and stays there, then we may lock out, and this deficit may be less. But if oil does retreat, um, it could be the opposite. So I'm um, afraid, like I said a minute ago, it's a gamble. We just don't know. Is there anything in the budget that would help the debt bubble? A debt bubble? Uh, <laughs> well, low interest rates are the best thing the government's got going for it right now. Uh, and as long as interest rates stay low, then the argument can be made, well, you know what, maybe this is a good time to blow the wad. Maybe this is a good time to go into, you know, a huge amount of debt because it's going to cost the government less to actually carry that debt. That's a valid argument. But I don't know how long it's going to last. The United States raised interest rates in December for the first time in 10 years. They're going to raise them probably two more times, at least in 2016. And 90% of the time, more than 90% of the time in history, the Bank of Canada has followed the American uh, Central Bank and our bond market has followed their bond market. So it stands to reason we're probably going to see higher interest rates next year. So all of these projections could be uh, pretty much blown out of the water by that point again i just don't know gonna have to wait and see but i think it is a pretty substantial gamble 
The Trudeau government is pledging $370 million for transit in the B.C. Lower Mainland, that's Greater Vancouver. What happens if the provincial or city governments don't have or don't want to fund their share of transit? Yeah, that's right. It, it's a matched uh, funding program, and I mean, there certainly is a, a need for for more transportation in the Lower Mainland, and, uh, you know, I mean, Vancouver is you know, got a major transit deficit compared to, for example, Toronto or Montreal. Um, it's better than it was five years ago, but it certainly needs to, to be improved. Uh, and, you know, BC government finances are, they're okay right now compared to, say, Alberta or Ontario, uh, but the government may opt not to, to match that and, uh, and also the city of Vancouver. So there's no promises there. And this infrastructure spending, let's remember, it's going to take a few years before it really kicks in. Um, It's not like you're just flipping the switch and there's a whole bunch of shovel-ready projects around. There's a lot of engineering work that needs to be done, a lot of preparatory work that needs to go into uh, this kind of infrastructure spending. So uh, I'm pretty skeptical we're going to see any real net benefit um, this year or maybe not even next year. It's going to take a while. The B.C. trucking industry estimates they lose upwards of $3 billion a year stuck idling, waiting to get to the port to move uh, goods around the country. I mean, Vancouver is the busiest port in Canada. Do you think perhaps the federal government doesn't understand how important traffic movement in greater Vancouver is? Also, surveys show we have the worst traffic congestion in North America. (laughs) Yeah, for sure. And you just need to drive around for uh, about half an hour to, to figure that one out. Uh, so it is a, a pretty bad congested situation. And, uh, you know, the question, does the, do the feds really understand that? I, I, I don't think so. I don't think they do. Uh, and I don't think they kind of get the whole need for more transportation, um, spending around the country. Um, this budget was disproportionately heavy on spending in other areas. Now, granted, we need spending in other areas. Aboriginal people, yeah, they they deserve to have a lot more attention, but there was a disproportionate amount put into a relatively small band of the population there. CBC, yeah, it deserves more funding, maybe, but there was a whole bunch of money going in into that. So a lot of special interest spending happening in this budget, and when you take a look at the infrastructure of spending, it's being spread over 10 years. So that assumes a second liberal mandate as well. And that may be a stretch. So I think it was overdone. It was overplayed. And again, as I said a few minutes ago, it's going to take a long time to see any benefit here. So uh, I think we should be prepared for the fact that this is going to be a long haul back. Did you see anything in the budget that would diversify Alberta's economy and Canada's economy to get us away from our dependence on oil? Uh, short answer, no. Um, there was certainly lip service to green technologies, but again, it's just lip service. It's uh, a necessary investment in the future and in technologies that are worthwhile. But I don't think our energy dependence is going to end. I do think the federal government is banking, as is the Alberta government, on the fact we're going to get back to oil that is, um, you know, certainly better valued, better priced than it is now. Thank goodness we've had a bounce back in the price of oil from less than thirty dollars, pretty close to twenty-five bucks, back up to around forty. That's been a dramatic increase. Oil has gone up by thirty percent in the past six weeks. That has been um, a godsend to uh, both Alberta and Ottawa, but it has to hold now. But I don't think there is really any political will to break the dependence on oil in Canada. Uh, I don't know what else to say. Uh, Canadian oil is not the most favored in the world. Our oil is considered to be dirty oil by a lot of people in the United States. We don't really have the pipeline capacity we need to have, and that's not, not going to come anytime soon. So I don't think this is cycle is going to be broken, and Canada's economy, I think, is going to remain pretty resource-based. The good news is that resources right now are at a, the lowest point they've been since the 1990s and are destined to to bounce back. The world needs oil. It needs copper and aluminum and grain and nickel, and it needs all of the base metals 
that have been so in disfavor. So the Canadian stock market, Canadian investors, they've all suffered from the commodity price decline. I think it's cyclical, and I think the pendulum has swung too far. So I'm anticipating that the Canadian economy, the Canadian market, and Canadian investments are going to be substantially higher by the end of 2016 than they are now. And governments will benefit from that the same way Canadian investors will. We'll have more with Garth Turner next on This Week in Money. Unbelievable harmony, spectacular performance, the ultimate tribute to the Everly Brothers and Simon and Garfunkel, Bird Dog, and the Vintage Electric Band coming to Mission White Rock, West Vancouver. Buy online and save at ontourtickets.com. This Week in Money is archived online at talkdigitalnetwork.com. Welcome back. We're speaking with Garth Turner, former National Revenue Minister and now an investment advisor at Raymond James in Toronto. Garth, if you were finance minister for just one day even, what could you do to make Canada an economic powerhouse? (laughs) Yeah, that's a great question. Well, I... I think it would be a bit different than the government we've got now. I think the way we really have to advance is try to be extremely competitive. Um, We're in a global world right now, and and thinking we can build some walls around Canada is not the right thing. And thinking we can increase taxation in Canada and be out of step with the rest of the world is equally foolhardy. Um, I was hoping that the small business tax rate was going to be dropped, in Canada, as the Liberal government had promised and during the election campaign, it was, you know, vowed to us that this rate would go down to 9%. That would just help so much with job creation, and it would help to make Canada more competitive with the world. Um, but we didn't get it, and the government dropped the rate from 11 to 105 Well, big deal. Uh, it certainly wasn't the drop that we anticipated. And I do, I do think that corporate taxation is going to be next in the crosshairs, uh, and probably the next budget or two is going to increase the rate of corporate tax. That may look sexy. It may look like somebody else is paying more money through corporations so that we can give more money to families, for example, but that doesn't make us more competitive. So we're in this global uh, race right now for investment capital, and I think if we want to attract more to that, to Canada, we really need to be um, as competitive as possible in terms of taxation, or else we're going to lose more, lose more investment to other jurisdictions. The top personal federal tax rate above 200000 has increased from 28% to 33%. Will that hurt Canada's competitiveness? Yeah, it will, actually. I know this is not popular to say, but I think creating that tax bracket was almost as dumb as dropping the TFSA annual contribution limit. Those were, to me, two really boneheaded moves. They weren't part of the budget. They came just before the budget. I'll tell you why. Um, There are only about 260,000 people in all of Canada who make more than $220,000 a year. That's a piteously low number. And I think it really shows how much our economy is suffering that we have so few high income earners and about a third of those people are doctors they're not entrepreneurs they're doctors so when you remove them we have a precious small number of people who are actually high income earners which generally tend to be business owners and people who are entrepreneurs and um, many people who are, are creating businesses there's nothing wrong with having wealthy people There's nothing wrong with having people who are uh, investing a lot and and taking a lot as their share of of the proceeds. They generally tend to be people who are creating corporations. So now we've created a new income tax bracket, and that basically pushes these people from about 48 or 49 or 50 percent tax rates up to around 52 or 53 percent taxation. So we're taking more than half of the money that they're actually earning. Well, talk about a disincentive, especially when you can go to the United States and pay 20% less income tax on the same income. Uh, it really will force some people to reconsider whether they want to remain in Canada or whether they want to go to the United States and invest their money there and get compensation, which is really taxed at a lower rate. So I think it was a counterproductive move. I don't support it. 
and you actually don't make countries richer uh, or you don't get a more equitable, fairer society by really deciding to take from people who are already high taxed and give it to other people. That just doesn't create any overall additional wealth. I know that's not um, popular right now, and it's not part of the liberal credo, but I just think it's sound economic fact. As for the TFSA contribution drop, big mistake. Big mistake. Um, I know a lot of people argue, well, you know, it's only wealthy people who can find an extra ten grand a year to put into these things. So, you know what? We should just end it because it's just a sop to the rich. A couple of things to remember. All of the contributions to TFSAs are made in after-tax Dollars. If you really want to worry about rich people, then maybe you should end the RRSP because that is geared to benefit people who are in higher tax brackets. They get a bigger tax deduction. But TFSAs are made in after-tax income. These are dollars everybody's already paid tax on. So if you're a high income earner, you've already paid 50, 52% of your income in tax and then you take what's left and put it into a TFSA. So you're disproportionately penalized more than someone who's paying 20% or 30% tax and then they can put the remainder into the TFSA. Secondly, remember TFSA contribution limits last your whole life. If you can't afford to take advantage of it now, maybe when you're 25 years old and just trying to start a family or buy a home, when you're 55 years old, this room will have accumulated your whole life and maybe you'll get a retirement package or maybe you're laid off and can move money into a TFSA, at that time, it would truly be to your benefit to have accumulated this TFSA room all your life. So I think people are being really short-sighted right now, and sadly, Mr. Trudeau is taking advantage of that ignorance and myopia uh, to really just make a political statement. So I think the guy has made some pretty serious mistakes. Maybe he's done some good things. But I don't think that was one of them. What happened to Trudeau's plan to legalize marijuana and reaping the windfalls of taxes? Uh, I've heard an estimate of as as much as $5 billion a year in pot taxes was available. Yeah, well, who knows? Um, he's definitely going to run into uh, roadblocks. It's easy to say that on the campaign trail. It's really hard to do. I mean, every cop force in Canada is against this. Every police chief has said, you know, are you crazy? This is this makes no sense. I mean, we just don't have any laws, for example, on people smoking and getting high and starting to drive. We have no way of measuring that. So, you know, this is all these problems. We've got trade treaties that, you know, this abrogates by legalizing drug use. So there's a whole bunch of stuff that I don't think these guys ever really addressed before making this kind of promise. In terms of tax revenues, well, you know what? We get $8 billion a year from cigarettes. That's a huge number. Does that mean we have a net benefit in Canada from people smoking tobacco? And Well, we don't, of course, because we spend over $30 billion a year in trying to care for the health risks and the diseases caused by people ingesting tobacco. Well, you can't tell me that ingesting or smoking marijuana is actually going to be any healthier than ingesting tobacco. I mean, it may not be quite as bad, but you're certainly not going to have a $5 billion net benefit, not when you consider the policing aspects, the legal aspects, um, the regulatory aspects, and then the health aspects. So, I don't know. I'm just as happy we're not going down that road. And I hope the I hope Mr. Trudeau has had sober second thoughts. Do you believe it was just dangled there to get the younger voters he wanted? Yeah, and it worked, didn't it? <laughs> <laughs> well, what more so- do I need to say? Garth, Peter Rutledge did a back of the envelope calculation published by the National Bank of Canada on foreign home ownership. He figures Chinese investors spent around twelve point seven billion on real estate in Greater Vancouver in twenty fifteen out of the total sales of nearly $39 billion. Now, if we ignore the Chinese investors, what about the other $25.8 billion? Was this money spent by speculators, investors, or just people looking for a place to live in one of the nicest places on Earth? Yeah, well, good question. I'm glad you brought it up, actually. Um, I was pretty shocked yesterday uh, when I saw the, the headlines. Uh, you know, One-third of all houses in Vancouver are bought by Chinese. 
What a load of crap. And I'll tell you what, Peter Rauschlich should be ashamed of himself for this report, and the National Bank should fire his butt for even having their name associated with it. He had zero Canadian data, zero. How did he then, how could he possibly ascertain that a third of houses in Vancouver are bought by Chinese foreigners? Well, he couldn't. What Routledge did is he took a look at the U.S. data because they do count foreign non-resident purchases in the United States. He took a look at the amount of foreign dollars spent in the United States by Chinese investors buying American real estate. Okay, not Canadian, 100% American. Then he said, well, how can I extrapolate that to Canada? Well, he couldn't because there's no data. So he found a survey out of the United Kingdom, a survey of 77 Chinese people who had bought real estate outside of China. 77, that's all. And he found of those 77 people, nine of them had actually bought real estate in Vancouver. So then he extrapolated, well, nine over 77 equals 11.7%. So I'll take that British number and then I'm going to multiply it by the American total number of uh, total aggregate of Chinese investment in the U.S. And then I'm going to extrapolate that to Canada and then I'll hypothesize it to Vancouver. That was the methodology. Absolutely total crap. And so there is nothing to be gleaned from that whatsoever. When we get data out of Canada or out of Vancouver that is Canadian data, then we can talk about it. So far, the government of British Columbia and the Real Real Estate Association of British Columbia both estimate it's around 5% of buyers in Vancouver are Chinese nationals, not 30%. So I think that not only should the bank be ashamed of this, I think any media in Canada that ran a a story with a headline saying a third of houses in Vancouver are Chinese bought, they also need to have their little wrists slapped. And perhaps they may be just confusing lower mainland residents who are already here, calling the local Chinese population Chinese nationals. Well, exactly. I mean, Vancouver is the most Asian city in Canada. We all know that. It's been that way for a 100 years. There's lots of people of Asian heritage and Chinese ethnicity living in Vancouver and Richmond and Surrey and Burnaby and Twasson and all over the place. And, of course, you know, they're there. They love houses the same way everybody else does. They love living in Vancouver. They want to move up. And there's a lot of buying activity and there's a cultural bias towards real estate in that particular community. Nothing new there. So I just think all of this does is fan the flames. Uh, We've got high house prices in Vancouver because we have low mortgage rates and people can carry more debt. And in Vancouver, people seem to have no predilection about getting into a massive amount of debt. And real estate in Vancouver has always carried a premium over the rest of the country. And these low rates and this house lust in Vancouver has just exacerbated it. And then you get these headlines about, you know, foreign nationals coming in. And people say, oh, my God, I better buy buy now or buy never because the guys from Beijing are going to snap all our houses. So I just think it's a bad combination of things. And when there is a correction, the people who swallow this junk are definitely going to be hurt more than those who adopt a reasonable approach. I was just going to ask you about that. If there is a big downturn in Vancouver real estate, will these speculators be the first ones who get burned or the last ones to sell? Uh, they'll get burned quick. And people who have you know, been flipping houses or buying houses on spec, uh, carrying them for a short period just so they could resell them into a rising market, they have a huge amount of risk on their hands. I don't think the market's going to collapse, and I don't think there's going to be like a pivotal event. I think it'll come down slowly, but as it starts to deflate, uh, flatline first and then deflate, that's going to be enough to cause panic among those people who bought in with a huge amount of debt or a speculative nature, thinking that this market is going to go up forever because there's always going to be some Chinese dude back of the and behind you who's going to come and snap up the, these properties. Well, they're not going to be there. And once our market starts to turn, you're going to see a lot of people who really want nothing to do with it. So a lot of risk there, Jim, and I think people need to be aware of that. 
Are there any classic signs that we're about to see a real estate bubble break? Well, I think the higher you go, the more that uh, you get close to it. And certainly as we look for more and more scapegoats uh, and prices go higher, the average price of a detached home at $1.8 million now in Vancouver is absurd, uh, given the fact it's 11 or 12 times the average income multiple. I think the fact that we worry about... Uh, you know, flipping realtors like this Christie Clark, uh, BC government uh, edicts the other day against uh, we're going to ban assignment clauses in real estate deals was junk. And it's just looking for scapegoats for the fact that we've got runaway situation. I think we're way closer to the peak than most people, most people think. Is there anything governments really can do to control speculation in real estate? Sure they can. They can bring in a speculation tax, and that's a simple thing to do. If you buy a property and sell it within 12 months, you're going to be subject to capital gains tax on it, the same as if you bought a stock or a mutual fund or an ETF and sell it within 12 months and make money. You pay capital gains tax. That's a simple, simple thing to do. So anyone who buys a home and sells it within 12 months, they probably didn't buy it to live in it. They bought it to speculate. So I, I think if politicians just have their guts to bring in that simple measure, and there can be exceptions for people who have life changes or they get forced out of town for another job or something, pretty simple to uh, cope with that. But I think, Jim, that that would be the, uh, the be-all and end-all, and I think we'd see a real end of speculation and a cooling of the market because of it. So come on, Christy, man up. BC Hydro did a survey showing that the vacancy rate in homes in Vancouver at 7% is exactly the same as it was 10 years ago. A lot of myth surrounding this real estate thing, isn't there? Yeah, I think there is. Um, people want to believe what they want to believe, and, you know, prices go up. You know, Vancouver is kind of, I hate to say it, people won't like me saying it, but it is an immature city. You know, there's people who live in other big cities, whether it's New York or Toronto, Chicago, San Francisco, they don't actually expect to live in the best neighborhoods on average incomes, but people in Vancouver still do. And people who, you know, were brought up a generation ago uh, living on the west side and, and their folks were, you know, just kind of average people with average incomes. Now they can't live on the west side. They think something dramatically has happened. Well, it hasn't. I mean, all of our cities have become more global. they become um, more of the enclave for the rich, the best neighborhoods in many of the great cities in North America are no longer affordable to people on average incomes. But in Vancouver, the, there's the expectation that that still is going to happen. Um, so I, I just think it's an ev evolution. Uh, we're in a difficult phase right now in, in Vancouver in the Lower Mainland, but I'm telling you, we're not going back, so get used to it. A lot of people fear Vancouver is going to become just a playground for the rich. Any danger of that? Some neighborhoods, yeah, for sure. You're not going to move on the west side with an average income, as I've just been saying. Uh, it's not going to happen. So, you know, you're not going to move in the kits anymore with, with an average income. You're certainly not going to be living in Point Grey with an average income. So there are places that are, are going to change. But take a look at the east side. Take a look at East Vancouver. I mean, you've got a gentrific gentrification going on where you've got million-dollar properties are now routine there. So then the whole nature of the urban area is changing, and I think people's expectation needs to change as well. Some areas will become maybe not the playgrounds of the rich, but they'll become the enclaves of, of the rich, and I just think that is an evolution you are not going to turn the clock back on. It's it's like you said, time for the city to grow up. If you were the yeah. prime minister right now or could give advice to Justin Trudeau about this budget, what's something you'd tell him, look, buddy, this has to be changed if we're going to have economic growth in Canada? Well, again, you need to be careful not to uh, put us into eternal deficits. I do think that's a problem. Um, the budget now, uh, the process, we're definitely into a decade of deficits. Uh, and at the end of the day, higher deficits equal higher taxes. That's all they are. They are deferred taxation. And uh, all we're doing, as I said when we started this call, Jim, if I were 30 years old, I don't think I'd be too happy to have this prime minister who has gotten us onto this 
this track of uh, a decade of, of deficits. It will guarantee that uh, as I get older, I'm going to be facing higher ta- personal levels of taxation. I don't think it's the way to go. Uh, in fact, I think it should be the opposite. In Europe, where they've gone to negative interest rates, the insurance industry there is now in trouble because they don't get any return on their investments. The banks are in trouble and pension funds are in trouble because of negative interest rates. Yet I still hear the Canadian uh, Bank of Canada governor make noises about negative interest rates. Why would they want to do something like that? Uh, they don't want to do it and it will not happen either. There will not be negative interest rates in Canada or the United States. They have the ability to do it. If they wanted to, they could. And that's all the Bank of Canada was saying uh, a few months ago was we're adding that to our tool chest. But uh, I tell you, if we ever got to the point where they were considering negative interest rates, we would be in the, th- the grip of a very severe recession and deflation. Uh, I don't think either of those things are going to occur. So negative interest rates have been a, a problem. Um, they've been trying to help a deflationary European economy, which is in a lot worse shape than, than ours. Um, but, uh, Jim, I, I just don't think anyone should worry about that. Negative interest rates will not happen in Canada. Major bank defaults will not happen in Canada. There will never be the so-called bank bail-ins happen in Canada. And truly, don't believe all this negative stuff you read on the Internet on Doomer websites. <laughs> it's there to scare you into buying hunks of gold, and that too is a bad idea. Should Canadians still remain an optimistic nation? I feel naturally optimistic, I think. Is there anything that can take that away from us? No, you should be optimistic. We've gone through a bit of a rough patch, and that's been because of commodity prices. I mean, we had the, the, the financial collapse of 08, 09. That knocked the stuffing out of everybody. But we recovered from it reasonably well, and then we got hit with this commodity price decline. And that hit us more than the U.S., so the U.S. is growing quite nicely. If we didn't have such a dependence on commodities, we'd be growing the same. But the good news is that the pendulums will swing back again. The world still needs oil and grain and copper and all those things. So these prices will restore somewhat, and I think Canada will do a lot better. I'm optimistic going forward, and I think at the end of this year, uh, things will look a lot better than they do right now. Garth, how can people find out more about Raymond James Investment? <laughs> well, you know, I, I run a financial advisory practice. Um, Raymond James is my corporate partner. But, yeah, you know, if anybody wants to know any more about this, they can just go to my, my website. My blog is probably the easiest. Greaterfool.ca uh, is my daily blog. And if you're interested in any of this stuff, you can find links from there. Garth, thanks a lot for being on This Week in Money. Pleasure as always, Jim. Thank you. My guest has been Garth Turner, former National Revenue Minister. That wraps up our show for this week. We'd like to thank our guests, Ross Clark and Garth Turner, and thank you for listening. Comments or questions for the show can be emailed to info at howstreet.com. I'm Jim Goddard. We're back next week with more This Week in Money. This Week in Money is a production of How Street Media Incorporated.